Don't you miss those times where we can get together and lift up our voice and raise our hand and praise God in a such a powerful way? The modern science and technology have achieved an unimaginable progress of conquering many different distances. In 1960s, after the Congress passed the um, special the, uh, policies for immigrants from Asian countries, people from Asia, the new immigrants came, came to United States. And when they did in 60s, it took them almost like three long months of a voyage across the uh, Pacific Ocean. Nowadays, it only takes about 14 hours of direct flight. Before automobile was created and produced, people traveled mostly on horseback or sometimes on foot. And it often took them days of travel for people to reach their destiny. And these days, it would only take several hours or so. We conquered many distances, previously inconceivable to do so. Space shuttle, you know, Columbia, already made a numerous round trips to an international space station in the orbit, launching against the pool of gravity the space shuttle travels into space 220 miles above the Earth. The International Space, uh, space Station orbits at an average speed of 17,227 miles per hour. You can imagine how fast it may be. And the ISS makes a multiple orbits around the Earth every day. And talking about conquering distances, this is certainly one of the fine examples of it. Let us take a step a little bit further. You know, NASA has launched a special project they call a Project Mars. And they are hoping that by 2035, NASA anticipates sending a four-person rocket capsule to Mars, which is about 249 million miles apart from Earth. With the technology, we have conquered many great distances with automobile, airplane, rockets, and spaceship. And this is truly a marvelous achievement that no other previous generation had ever enjoyed. But, but what about non-physical distance? For example, distance between what we know and what we do distance between our head and our heart, distance between you and your neighbor. What about distance between a brother or a sister who worship together in this space? And especially when you look at the screen, we are just right one inch or two inches apart from each other distance between parents and kids? What about distance between intellectual knowledge and our moral and ethical life and action? Even when we conquer enormous physical distances, yet the distance between our heart and Jesus' heart seems so immense, the distance between our head and our heart still seems to be so far away. How could we ever hope to overcome such a short distance and yet seemingly the greatest 
distance. As long as the eyes of our mind look at the things differently from the eyes of our heart, this distance can never be overcome. Intelligence and critical knowledge in our head must be brought together into a sacred place in us, in our soul, where convictional knowledge of our heart is also brought together. It is to order that heart also has a reason that which mind sometimes cannot fully comprehend. Do you know that this sacred place in your soul where both heart and mind can, can be brought together and where both our intellect and our purposeful action interwoven together or even both our faith and action walk hand in hand together. It is called love. This sacred and hospitable space that created by love and for loving God and loving others. Love is more than an intentional and love is more of an intentional and willful action than mere feeling, like, you know, feelings that we talked about. Unless this immense relational distance is conquered, unless both our heart and mind find a meaningful common ground, transformation of our heart would hardly occur. Even as we worship together at this moment, we may claim that we have conquered physical distances. But can you truly claim and know that you have conquered relational and qualitative distance between us, you and I, between you and your friend and our members? What do I really know about my brother who used to sit next to me in the worship sanctuary? Do I understand wholeheartedly kind of struggle that my sister may go through, may, may be going through now. And this is why it is important to ask, how could we have the loving heart of Jesus Christ so that we can live a life of love, loving myself the way that God intended so that we could love others with respect and love and care. Are you ready for the su surprise? The answer is, you already do. If you are in Christ, you already have the heart of Jesus Christ, one of the supreme yet unrealized promise of God is simply this. If you have given your heart and your life to Christ, and Jesus Christ has given himself to you. He has made your heart his home. Paul articulates this interesting mystery quite eloquently in Galatians chapter 2. He says, it is no longer that I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Jesus has moved in and unpacked his bags and is ready to change you into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. And we can see this from 2 Corinthians. In today's 1 Corinthian passage, Paul uses the word mega to describe love. Paul has learned from Jesus that the love that God possesses and has given us is the greatest thing in life. And durability and consistency is the reason because love never ends, which is to say that it does not fall down, it does not wither away, it does not diminish in its power 
or efficacy. You know the same Greek word pipto, to fall, describes what happened when Apostle Paul met Jesus on his way to Damascus. He fell down. And the same word was used when the young man, Eutychus, heard Paul preach, but he preached a long sermon. And overcome by sleep, he was, he fell, and he was picked up dead. But falling down, falling down is something that love does not do. The psalmist already said with conviction that God's steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 100. Love not only does never end, but also blooms even on the harsh conditions of life. Someone may couldn't love in our living room. Maybe someone is quitting on love in our church, or even in our nation, or in our generations, because it may be too difficult to keep, too inconvenient to embrace, but that doesn't render love extinct. In God's hand, love always pops up and blooms somewhere even amid the harshest conditions like many of us are going through these days. Love, like in the instance, blooms and resurrects again. As we've seen in the Jesus Christ on the cross, forgiving many of his enemies. Their loveless heart, the hatred in their heart could not kill love in Jesus' heart. For love never, never ends. In contrast are the good things from God to fall down. These things pass away and they cease. Their purpose is temporal. Such good things from God can also exist in ways that are incomplete, partial, or gradual. Love is numbered among a few things in this world that remains forever. Among those few very precious things, as Paul described to us, faith, hope, love. Love is the one worthy of the greatest honor. People in Corinth has come to believe that closeness to God and influence among neighbors is somehow tied to these good things that fall down, like the right celebrity preachers or the uh, possession of the best spiritual gift gift of prophecy, gift of foreseeing the future, gift of speaking in tongues, etc. And but belong to the group like that has both. In believing so, what Jesus taught is getting set aside and lost. It is by our law, not by our gift, celebrities or knowledge, or preaching, or faith, or sacrifice, that those around us will know that we belong to Jesus. With our love, we can only communicate that. Do you want to do something great for God as an individual, or even as a church? True greatness is not found amid all these other good, necessary and important things, but something wider, deeper and higher and longer and greater waits for our attention. Without this greatest thing, these other goods have no true sources 
or no true value and purpose. Obtaining prestigious power and positions is a great thing, but without love, you and I gain nothing. Or at best, a very little thing. Pursuing great things for God, but without love, is to build a congregation of insignificance and meaningless noise. The world is already full of meaningless noises, and you and I, we don't need to add just one more. Standing by together with the word of St. Paul, which I recited last week. And here we go. And I'm reading it again because it is so powerful and it is so encouraging. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing in this world can separate us from God's love. For love never, never ends. Even though this side, this side of heaven, we are, we are incomplete and the perfect hasn't come yet. But when we see our Lord Jesus face to face, all riddles of life will be answered. All our incompletion will be made complete and sanctified. And all our partial understanding will be fully understood. When the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. In the face of perfection, all imperfection do come to an end. So let us dwell in the convictional words of St. Paul. Again, that was read by Sharon. And um, Usan. Here we go. Love never ends. But as for the prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of this is love. Praise the name of the God, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.